Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. I'm here with another A-level chemistry exam question walkthrough. This time we're looking at group seven, the halogens. This is a viewer requested content, so don't forget to give me your ideas in the chat if you have a particular topic you'd like me to cover. In this walkthrough, as ever, I'll be showing you my thoughts behind the question in blue and the answers that are going to get you the marks are going to be in green. The question that I've chosen for us to have a look at is a 13 mark question that ranges through three or four of the different reactions that the halogens can undergo. And the first one is the concentrated sulfuric acid reaction where you add the concentrated sulfuric acid to the solid sodium halide. In this case it's chloride but it could be chloride, bromide or iodide and you need to know what can happen in each of those three scenarios. If you remember, this is to prove the reducing ability of the halide ion. And all three of these halide ions do slightly different things with the concentrated sulfuric acid, depending on how good their reducing ability is. Now, hopefully you remember that as we go down the group, the chloride ion, bromide ion and iodide ion gets respectively larger. Chloride is the smallest, iodide gets biggest at the bottom and the bromide is in the middle. And as a result of that, these ions hold on to their electrons less well as the ion gets larger. And that's because the electrostatic attraction between the positive nucleus at the center of the atom gets further away from the outer electrons. And so there is a weaker electrostatic attraction between the outer electron and the positive nucleus. And so as a result of that, in this first question where we're looking at the sol solid sodium chloride, the chloride ion is such a bad reducing agent that it doesn't in fact reduce the sulfuric acid at all. It reacts with it in an acid-base reaction and the sulfuric acid is a proton donor. And so in this reaction, the sodium chloride reacts with the sulfuric acid and we make sodium hydrogen sulfate and hydrogen chloride. And this isn't a reduction reaction because the sulfur is plus six in H2SO4 and it's still plus six in the sodium hydrogen sulfate as well. So redox has not happened. And so this is actually a reaction that all three of the sodium halides would do, but sodium chloride only does this because it is such a poor reducing agent because of its such small size means it holds on to its electrons very strongly. Then in the second part of the question we are told that fumes of sulfur dioxide are formed when sodium bromide reacts with the concentrated sulfuric acid thereby proving that the bromide is a better reducing agent than the chloride. And then this is a three mark question, but we've been given three separate commands, so it'll be one mark for each of them. We've been asked to give an observation for this reaction, give an equation and state the role of the sulfuric acid. Now, this is just something just, just to remember here. The sulfuric acid is acting as an oxidizing agent. And we know it is because it is taking an electron, it's accepting an electron from the bromide ion. And the bromide ion is the reducing agent. In terms of the equation, there's actually a number of different equations that you can write. Now suppose you're in an exam and you can't remember what the equation is. What you have to remember is parts of what's happening, or halves of, of what's happening, and then piece the rest together. So the bromide ion does what bromide ions usually do, which is turn into bromine. And so in terms of the half equation, we have to follow the steps which I've covered in another video, but I'll write along the bottom. First of all, we balance for atoms that aren't oxygen or hydrogen, so we need the two in front of the bromide. Then we balance for oxygen by adding water, not necessary here. Then we balance for hydrogen by adding hydrogen ions, again not necessary. And last of all, we balance for charge by adding electrons to this equation on the respective correct side. And the side that it needs to go on to is the right hand side, because at the moment we've got two minus on the left hand side, and so we need two minus on the right hand side as well to make it negative two on both sides. So that's the bromide half equation showing that bromide is being oxidized. 
And then we're told that sulfur dioxide is made in the other half equation from the sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid has got the ion SO4 2 minus. Now we need to follow those steps again. Sulfur, well, there's one on both sides. Oxygen, this time that is unbalanced. So we have to balance for the oxygen by adding two H2O onto the right hand side. Now we've got four hydrogen on the right hand side. We don't have any on the left hand side. So we have to add four hydrogen ions on the left hand side. Finally, we're looking at the charge. The right hand side has no charge because both the sulfur dioxide and the water have no charge. The left hand side is four plus because of those four hydrogen ions two minus because of the sulfate. So overall that currently stands at two plus on the left hand side. And so we need to add another two electrons to the left hand side to make both sides of the equation have a charge of zero. Now, if you remember when you combine the half equations, we need to make sure we've got a common multiple for the electrons, two for the sulfate gaining and two for the bromide losing. Well, that's already balanced. So all that we need to do here is add those two equations together. And overall, we're left with 4H plus plus 2Br minus plus SO4 2 minus makes SO2, Br2 and 2H2O. And that's already balanced because two electrons were gained by the sulfate and two electrons were lost by the bromide. And that, by the way, proves that bromide is a better reducing agent than chloride because it was able to make the sulfur gain two electrons, whereas the chloride couldn't make the sulfur gain any electrons. There are other answers that you could give that amount to the same chemical process taking place. And so I'll put a couple of those at the bottom because I don't have space to write them in on the same line here. This one, though, I think is the easiest. And certainly I think it's the one that's easiest to come up with from half equations that you can kind of piece together yourself. And last of all, we're asked what we would observe, and that is that bromine has got colour. And so bromine is a brown gas or brown fumes or orange gas or orange fumes. It's certainly browny orange in colour. I would encourage you to go for brown, really, but either of those gets you the mark here. Then in part C, we move on to a totally separate type of question. This time, chlorine, the element chlorine rather than the chloride ion, is reacting with hot aqueous sodium hydroxide as shown in the reaction below. We've been asked to give the oxidation state of chlorine in both of these two chemicals. And so the NaClO3, remember sodium is plus one because it's a group one element. Oxygen is minus two and there are three of them. And then that means that the chlorine is cancelling out all of that imbalanced charge. And overall, we've got a charge of zero. And we know that because there's no charge in terms of the superscript position here. There is no charge shown there. And similarly, by the way, there's no charge shown in the other one that we're going to work out in a second. And so what that means is we've got plus one because of the sodium, minus six gives us minus five overall, which means that the chlorine has to be a plus five to cancel all of the rest of the charge out. Then it's much easier on the one below. Sodium is plus one. Chlorine is the thing that we don't know about, and that adds together to make zero, which gives us an oxidation state of the chloride in this one of minus one. So what's interesting is that chlorine is beginning the reaction as zero, and there's three lots of Cl2, so there's actually six chlorine atoms beginning the reaction with an oxidation state of zero. And one of the chlorines is going to plus five, and the other chlorines, all five of the others, are going to minus one. And so in terms of redox, as this question is asking us, what's actually taking place in reaction C? Well, the actually the quick act uh, answer is it's undergoing disproportionation. And that word means it's undergoing oxidation and reduction, or it's oxidized and it's reduced. And that makes sense in terms of electrons because one of the chlorines must have been losing five to go from zero to plus five, and the other five chlorines must each individually have been gaining one to go from zero to minus one. So overall, that electron transfer cancels out. Five have been lost, five have been gained. This final part of the question is a tricky six mark question, which is a mixture of chemical testing and equations for the formation of various products that are produced. 
and it starts by telling us that we've got a mixture of solution Y, which has got two different negative ions. Then we read a little bit further about what they actually do to solution Y. They add silver nitrate solution, and if we pause here, silver nitrate solution should be making you think, okay, right, they are testing for the X minus ion, where X is something from group seven. So instantly we are thinking, well, maybe our negative ions are F minus, CL minus, BR minus, or I minus. What they do next is add an excess of nitric acid. And hopefully that will be making you think, where do I know that from? And you add nitric acid to acidify the silver nitrate to react with any other impurities that might be present, such as the carbonate ion. And last of all, they add an excess of concentrated ammonia solution. So this is really tying everything together now as a detailed silver nitrate investigation. And the ammonia solution, if you remember, dissolves some of the precipitates that form. Diluted ammonia solution dissolves some of them and concentrated dissolves others. Other negative ions that could possibly be on the table in terms of chemical tests that you need to be aware of are the sulfate ion and the hydroxide ion. And so we need to have in mind all of these available options when we start to look at the observations that they've made, which is what we should move on to now. The first thing they did was added the silver nitrate solution. And when they did that, they observed a cream precipitate. And what that should be making you think from the list of ions that we've just discussed is that there must be Br- ions present because that cream precipitate is probably silver bromide, so AgBr solid. And if you remember, the ionic equation that that forms in is just simply Ag plus ion plus Br minus ion makes AgBr. And then the state symbol is solid and the other two are aqueous. That's not actually going to be asked here, but that's worth remembering for absolutely sure. Now, they also say that there's compound D and compound E being formed. So presumably AgBr is E or D. That's what we're thinking right now. Then they add an excess of dilute nitric acid and we get the cream precipitate D. So that, that means the precipitate is still there from before, or at least part of it is. But we've got bubbles of gas forming. Now, before we get any further about what the bubbles mean, we should confirm that the AgBr must therefore be compound D because AgBr wouldn't react with the nitric acid. It couldn't because they, there's normally nitric acid present in the silver nitrate test. So that's confirming that the precipitate D is AgBr. So all important here, we've added acid and we've got bubbles. Those bubbles must be carbon dioxide gas. That is one of the tests for carbonate ions. If you remember, you add an acid and if you see bubbles, that ion that was present was probably carbonate and the gas is certainly carbon dioxide. And you can prove that by turning the lime water cloudy by bubbling the gas that gets produced through that lime water. And when it goes cloudy, you know that you've made carbon dioxide, which means that you know you had carbonate ions present. And then last of all, when we add our concentrated ammonia solution, we get left with a colourless solution. And that colourless solution tells us that the precipitate has dissolved. So that means that the precipitate that formed reacted with nitric acid, so presumably was a carbonate, and then it dissolved in the presence of the concentrated ammonia, and so it must have been bromide or chloride. And because it was cream, that's confirming that it was bromide, silver bromide precipitate that has just dissolved. And we're told we've made a complex ion G. Everything that I've been saying so far has been the thinking behind the question. So now let's dig into what we're actually going to get our marks for. This is a six mark question and we've actually been given five different commands. So we've been told to give three formulas. Let's look at that first. The formula of D. Well, we've already worked that out. That is going to be AgBr. The formula of E is a little bit trickier. We know it contains the carbonate ion because the nitric acid reacted with it and we got carbon dioxide. 
and we have to assume that it was the silver that was present in the silver nitrate that formed this confusing precipitate because that's what typically happens. That's why we acidify the silver nitrate in the first place. So that means that we've got the silver ion Ag plus and we've got the carbonate ion CO3 2 minus. And so the formula of silver carbonate is going to be Ag2CO3. Moving on to F, formula of F, well, we've already said that F is carbon dioxide. The ionic equation to form E, well, we've pretty much already constructed that. We know that E is Ag2CO3, and we know, therefore, that it must be forming from the carbonate ion and the silver ion. So once you know what something's formula is in terms of on the product side, the ionic equation is actually pretty straightforward because you're just looking at what the component ions are that make that formula up. And the component ions are CO3, 2 minus, and 2 silver ions. And that's very much the case as we did down at the bottom with the silver bromide. We know that it must contain silver ions, here we go, and bromide ions. And that's why ionic equations are often not quite as confusing as they at first seem. Then finally, we need to show the conversion of D into G. It's likely that there's going to be one mark for actually what G is, and then one mark for the rest of the equation. Now, G is going to be Tollens reagent because a little extra part of the halogens is that if you add concentrated ammonia solution to silver bromide, then you make Tollens reagent, which is the exact same thing as when you test for the silver mirror with the aldehydes. And so Tollens reagent, you just need to remember the formula for this one, is Ag and then NH3 2 but it's actually positively charged. It is an ion. And so that's what Tollens reagent is. Now we know that D, because we've written it, is AgBr. And so what we have to be adding to AgBr to make AgNH32 is obviously the ammonia. And clearly, since Tollens reagent has got two ammonia attached to the silver, then we need to add two ammonia in terms of our reactants. And last of all, where did the Br go? Well, it's present now as Br minus. And if you think about it in terms of charge, it must be negatively charged. If the Tollens is positively charged, and then overall it's got to have the same charge as the left-hand side, which is zero, the Br must be present as Br minus. And so here is our quite complicated equation with one mark for this correct formula for Tollens and the other mark for the correct construction of the equation. Okay, that's the end of this question walkthrough video. I'll be back again soon with another A-level chemistry video. Don't forget to give me your ideas in the comments and the discussion so you can choose which things I do next. Until then, goodbye.